can we call the plumage of pterosaurs feathers yet? Sometimes a paper comes out and it blows the doors off an existing paradigm. Other times an idea has existed for a while, but with kind of shaky support, so we've had to be diligent and scientific and accept that the evidence we have is suggestive but not conclusive and that we just have to be patient. But sometimes patience pays off. I am speaking about the homology between dinosaur fluff and pterosaur fluff which has seemed incrementally more likely as our understanding of the evolution of feathers in dinosaurs has gotten more refined. Similarly, the idea that both are descended from an ancestor with fluff has seemed more and more likely as consensus has emerged that dinosaurs and pterosaurs are very closely related. But we're not talking about that stuff today, at least not directly. I just wanted you to have that context in mind while I talk about the history of splitting hairs. We have known about pterosaur fuzz for nearly as long as we have known about pterosaurs, but Pinning down exactly what those structures are and what we should call them has been more difficult. In the 1830s, Goldfuss was working on a specimen of the animal we now call Scaphognathus, and he noticed these striations and discolorations in the rock that had been left by the animal's soft coat. He claimed there were some short hairs, his word, as well as some longer frond-like structures, though without a central quill. There were also these things he called Federbärchen, which literally means feather beards. I think it is a term for after feathers, and I was going to laugh at it because feather beard sounds like the name of a bird pirate, but then I was thinking about how in English we call certain parts of feathers barbs and barbules, which just means beard anyway. A generation later, von Meyer said that Goldfuss had an overly vivid imagination and that these were just rust, just oxidation in the rock. But then, in the 1920s and 30s, a worker named Brioli repeatedly insisted that various pterosaurs from Solnhofen and Holzmatzen had hair. But we didn't get a detailed description of any of that until the 70s and 80s, when Wellenhofer set to work dragging pterosaur paleontology into modernity. And if you're trying to reconstruct how pterosaurs ate and grew and moved and breathed, integument those hairs are a really important line of evidence. Evidence that workers in the 1990s had to track down and collate, like Padian and Rayner did, or catch up on describing it all, like Bakarina and Unwin did for the Sordes paratype. So, renewed interest in pterosaur integument just so happened to coincide with the first feathered non-avialin dinosaurs coming out of the Ishan Formation in China and people immediately noticed that, hey, these structures look really similar. In the early 2000s, Jerkos and G described the integument of Pterorhynchus, which sounds made up, and I recognize that all genus names are made up, but like that one especially, somehow. But that animal has, they say, three-dimensionally preserved branch structures resembling the down feathers of birds, but without barbules. And this is the earliest example I found of someone suggesting that the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs was fuzzy. That same year, and more relevant to our story, we got descriptions of two specimens of a little enurgnathid called Yehoiopterus. Uh, actually, the second specimen was not assigned to that genus at the time. It is a juvenile and might actually be a different genus, Dendrorhynchoides. Between the two specimens, we have much of the animal's coat. Hairs is clearly not an adequate term for it. One paper suggests using bristles, but I guess that didn't catch on. Both have statements to the effect of current evidence cannot prove or disprove that dinofuzz and pterofuzz are the same thing. We started to see some cladistic waffling that's going to sound familiar if you've looked in the history of dinosaur integument, but feathers at the time were only known in one extremely derived clade, and the closeness of the relationship between dinosaurs and pterosaurs was not clear, and Unwin, in addition to pointing that stuff out, made the observation that the hairs appear to be growing from the surface of the skin, not out of follicles the way that hair and feathers do. He argued that a difference in form reflected a difference in development. Kellner, Wang, and co-authors, again taking a look at Yehoiopterus, took another swing at a term for pterosaur fuzz. They came up with pycnifibers, from the Greek pyknos, meaning bushy. This term had some legs. Like Unwin, they had some cladistic objections to homology between dinofuzz and pterofuzz, but they also followed it up with a structural argument. They said that pycnofibers are themselves made up of multiple fibers or fibrils, but they didn't say why they said that. We kind of have bad luck here. Dinosaur and pterosaur integument at its most basic is just these simple filaments. So simple that more than one developmental pathway could have produced them. Maybe they grew from follicles, like our hair does, or maybe they were modified scales, or maybe they were just projections of the outermost layer of skin. 
and preservation being what it is, once they're fossilized, all three of those are gonna look the same to us. The only thing we could say is that if we found a fossilized feather with uniform barbs, that must have grown from a follicle, because barbs, as we understand them, require a follicle to be laid down. Okay, so what's changed? Well, as you may have heard, we've got some newfangled ways of looking at fossils. We can use wavelengths of light outside of the visible, because infrared, ultraviolet, and x-rays will excite molecules in different minerals in distinctive ways. So if you excite, for instance, the different fossilized parts of an organism, you can see how it absorbs infrared or how it fluoresces. You're probably familiar with UV fluorescence. It's why some stuff glows under a black light. It's emitting the light back to us at a lower energy, dropping it down into visible frequencies. But minerals also fluoresce at all kinds of wavelengths, visible or not. And with careful measurement of the signals we get from that, we can study a specimen's chemistry with very high precision. This is called spectrometry. We can also use these wavelengths to just take a picture, either with a microscope or through a regular camera lens. Some minerals, like the apatite in our bones, do fluoresce under UV, which means you can light your whole specimen, slab and all, and photograph it and you'll catch things that you wouldn't have seen with the naked eye. Workers revisited Goldfuss's scaphognathus using these techniques and partially vindicated him. Tischlinger in particular seems to have made it his mission to rehabilitate Goldfuss's place in the history of pterosaur research. I don't know if he ever printed t-shirts saying Goldfuss was right, but he should have. They found that a few of Goldfuss's soft tissues were indeed iron oxides or tricks of the light, but many of them were actually there, both individual fibers and clusters of fibers. There were also actinofibrils, which Goldfuss either didn't know about, because we didn't know how the pterosaur wing membrane was structured at the time, or he might have just thought they were wrinkles. If we go even more high-tech, we can hit our specimen with energy beams. Scanning electron microscopes use a beam of electrons, hence the name, and by detecting the energy that comes off of it, you can figure out its chemical makeup. But we can also use electrons as if they're a light source, which is how we take pictures of tiny structures like melanosomes, which are the cell organelles responsible for melanin pigments. And figuring out how to interpret those was a major breakthrough in paleocolor. Remember that for later too. We can also use a high intensity version of the light-based methods from earlier. This is called laser stimulated fluorescence, where you use a photon beam to excite one extremely specific part of your specimen at a time to analyze small samples or to take a long exposure photo of your specimen, sweeping the laser across it essentially pixel by pixel to get an amplified version of the UV fluorescence photography from earlier. Workers used these techniques in 2019 to report more details of a neurognathid fluff, which is not just pycnophilus fibers. There's actually different structures that we put into different categories called morphotypes, and we see different morphotypes on different parts of the body. Some are indeed simple filaments covering the animal's core. Others have barbs branching off, and we can distinguish these by whether they tuft out at the base, in the middle, or near the tip. Some are superficially like dinosaurs down. They occur on the wing membrane, and that might be unique to anurognathids. Others have these two sideways tufts in the middle, and those only seem to occur on the face. Still others are like tiny palm trees. They seem to occur in concave parts of the body. They're on the neck, the upper arms, the tops of the feet, and the base of the tail. Melanosomes, those pigment organelles, are present, but scanning an electron microscopy shows that they are all just simple balls the same that we find in modern reptile skin, and the melanosome shapes are not different either in different tissues or between different parts of the body. That's the third thing I will ask you to remember for later. And again, these sure do seem a lot like protofeathers. The authors pointed out that because we've always encoded pterosaur fuzz and dinosaur fuzz as separate characters, of course the computer keeps them separate in your analysis. You told it to. Now that's not the only problem with trying to model the evolution here, but they did tentatively recover the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs with protofeathers. Unwin and Martel disagreed with some of this, using some of the same arguments that Unwin had had about Sordes 20 years earlier. They said that what we're actually seeing are illusions created by the way the animal decayed. These are called taphonomic artifacts. They said that the different morphotypes were actually just partially decayed pycnofibers or partially decayed actinofibrils, which were unraveling their word, or Pycnofibers that had overlaid one another, creating the illusion of a more complex structure. Side note, in an experiment where they took a songbird called a siskin and flattened it in a printing press, it was dead before they flattened it, 
they found exactly the opposite of this hypothesis. When you crush the complex feathers of a bird, they take on the appearance of much simpler basal protofeathers. In any case, Yang and co-authors responded that if Unwin and Martel were right, wouldn't we see way more varieties of protofeather, and wouldn't they be more weakly zonated? Like, why would it so specifically decay in this part of the body and not in this part? Unwin and Martel did have a more substantial argument, which is that the spectrometry detected keratins that are not the type we would expect to see in feathering. Terminology detour. Properly, we should only call alpha keratins keratins, whereas beta keratins are corneous beta proteins. This is to emphasize the difference in structure between the two, as well as the difference in genetic code that builds them. So, our mammal skin and hair and nails are keratinous, as are the skin and wing membranes of reptiles, including dinosaurs and pterosaurs. But then, sauropsid hard bits, the scales and claws and beaks and feathers, are corneous. Which is making me feel like I did about feather beards again, because we're just choosing between calling them horn in Greek or in Latin. Regardless, the infrared spectrometry from the anurognathid integument looks like keratin from a body wall or wing membrane, not the corneous material that we would expect fluff to be made of. In their reply, Yang and co-authors repeated something they had said in the original paper, which is that this one is a taphonomic artifact. Corneous proteins, as they decay, can take on the appearance of keratins. I'm gonna skip ahead here. In 2023, some workers, including some of these same authors, confirmed this experimentally. They took black feathers from a chicken and white feathers from an egret and observed how they decayed in really controlled circumstances. They found that corneous protein sheets, when baked by fossilization, can transform into alpha helices, which infrared and x-ray spectrometry will detect as keratins, because they sort of are now. But the upshot is that if you have something that looks like a fluff fossil, detecting that it is is made of alpha keratin is not by itself disqualifying. But they hadn't confirmed that yet in 2019, and even though the anurognathid fluff seemed to fit a couple different morphotypes of dinosaur protofeathers, there were still differences in form suggesting differences in development. The branched fluff of anurognathids has branches of many different lengths, meaning that they could have grown irregularly. They didn't have to be laid down in an orderly fashion the way that bird feather barbs are inside the follicle. So unless we found fluffy pterosaur structures that were definitely not artifacts, that were branched along most of their length, and that had very regular barbs, the evidence was still pretty ambiguous as to AHA! Chinkota and just so many co-authors described these little branched feathers on the back of a crest of Tupandactylus from Brazil. The barbs are consistent in length and spread out along the length of the shaft. The specimen preserves these towards the tip of the crest, as well as longer simple filaments closer in, and long straight structural fibrils in the membrane sail part of the head crest. So, we have different protofeathers in different zones. They can't just be overlapping because there are individual branched feathers preserved. They can't just be decayed actinofibrils because there are fibrils in the head membrane preserved. Why would they decay there and not over here? Those little branched ones are a match for a certain feather that we find in, for example, Sinosauropteryx or Sinornithosaurus. This is called a radially branched shafted filamentous feather, which is a mouthful. The authors just call all of Tupandactylus's integumentary structures feathers, and if you can't tell, I am 100% on board with that. But it didn't stop there. Scanning electron microscopy found that the melanosomes have geometry specific to the tissue that they're in. In Tupandactylus, the melanosomes in the two different feather types are different from one another, as well as from the melanosomes in the skin. So these would have all been different colors in life. Prior to this discovery, we had partitioning like this in dinosaurs and mammals, where the fur will be more colorful, or at least more varied than the color of the skin, but we hadn't found it in pterosaurs, suggesting that it was secondarily lost. But clearly, at least some didn't, and if, as this paper's ancestral state reconstruction found, the ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs not only had protofeathers, but had protofeathers with their own special melanosome shapes, that could mean that the selective advantage of those early protofeathers was the ability to present more and different colors. That is probably the longest road we have ever taken from hey what's that to it was for display. I originally intended this to be just one segment of the Quetzalcoatlus video, but that would have been way too much. I am obliged to mention that it is still possible that dinosaurs and pterosaurs developed their fluff independently. C crazier convergences have happened, but 
that is less parsimonious and honestly kind of stubborn at this point. There's always been this inertia where feathers are the characteristic feature of birds, and finally, through attrition, we have expanded that to feathers are the characteristic feature of dinosaurs. Is it really such a jump to then go to feathers are the characteristic feature of ornithodirans? Why must this completely reasonable homology remain such a sticking point, and why can't I just call them feathers? I do love how much of this came down to examining our specimens with infrared or ultraviolet or x-rays or electrons. The, the evidence was in front of us, but our eyes couldn't see it. And I want to thank you for using your eyes to watch this video. And maybe you could direct your eyes to our Patreon page, or to the subscribe button, or to the like button. But in any case, we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. We would like to extend a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.